Hello, Fiona McIntosh, and welcome to Sydney. Good afternoon to Better Reading Readers. We at uh, Better Reading uh, love you. I know <laughs> that many of our readers love you. They often talk about you in our comments and what they've read. Now tell me, what number fiction book are we up to now? Well, um, the chocolate tin is number 31. Yes. Uh, I have to tell you, number 32 is almost finished, so um, I'm really roaring at the moment, which is you great. Are, I know. You are one of the hardest working writers that I know. Um, so what we, we know you most famously for The Perfumer's Secret, uh, for The Lavender Keeper. What's your favourite? Do you ever have a favourite? Is there something you absolutely love? Um, it's interesting. Do you have a baby? <laughs> no, because the one I'm working on is always the baby. Um, I fall in love with my characters. That has to work, particularly the leading men. I mean, I'm always going to write a strong woman. Um, she's always going to be there, but it's the men that orbit around her who become the challenge for me to make them different, make them special, make them sexy. Um, and unique. I think he, your stories, is, every one of them is just so unique. It's not like I'm reading the same book over again with different characters. It's not like that at all. That's wonderful to hear. That That's a real compliment because really what you have to try and do is deliver to your reader um, the same an, or an identical reading experience in terms of their emotional connect with it. But of course the story has to be so wildly different to keep them interested. And indeed for me too, to yeah. write it. You know, I wouldn't want to just keep writing the same formulaic kind of story. No, um, they're so, definitely not formulaic. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And I also don't think they're romances. A lot of people call me a romance writer with a capital mm. R. I'm not. You're not. I, I write romantic fiction in romantic settings with romantic eras and fashion and food and everything is matter. luscious yes it's luscious but it if it was romance with a capital r i'd need to always have a happy ending and it would have to follow the pattern that you want in your romances whereas i'm quite likely to kill off a popular character with no warning so you've yeah. been warned yeah you have been warned and you know they're not they're not at all predictable Okay, so let me say, we're here with Fiona McIntosh, we're in Sydney, we're talking to Fiona about her new book, do you want to hold it up? Um, yes, yes, The Chocolate Tin. The Chocolate Tin, and I'm just going to do a close up on the cover, because that is just so gorgeous, beautiful and luscious, and it really tells us a lot about the book. So do you want to tell me about the book, tell me about uh, the story? Alright, so it's, it's, it follows a similar um, theme that I like to play with, which is... Um, a young woman, a modern thinking woman in a, a previous age, and she is being pushed around by social norms um, such as duty, marriage, all you know, having a family, all of these things. But my women are always pushing back against society because they've got their own dreams, their own ambitions. So, with um, and they're independent thinkers, aren't they? Yeah, they are, even they, of the time. Yeah, they are, and they. Um, I usually use a wealthy tier of society because it, it allows me a lot more freedom because yeah. they can do so much more. Um, so, you know, she, she wants to be a chocolate maker and mm -hmm. to her parents, this is vulgar, darling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've got all these lovely men lined up to marry you. Now choose one or we'll choose one for you. So yeah. she really doesn't want to be cornered like that. And can I say she chose the wrong one? She makes a spectacularly bad decision. but. The interesting thing about this story is when I was writing it, I really thought there would be a villain and there isn't. The no. three characters that this story sort of revolves around are all rather attractive in their own way, even the spectacularly bad decision. Um, yeah. He's a lovely fellow. Yeah, he's just he's got a terrible secret that That's has right. potential to ruin Alex, ruin him, ruin their families, um, ruin their lives. Um, and so... You know, I mean, that is why she made a bad decision because she married out of um, convenience for the right person that she thought would allow her the freedom she needed to do what she wanted to yeah, do. Yeah. Now, Shirley Walden here says, Love Fiona McIntosh books. I so love these. you, Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> and Rene, uh, Rennie, Rennie Hoyer, awesome. So we've got some people jumping in. If you'd like to make some comments or indeed ask Fiona a question, 
please do. We're chatting with Fiona McIntosh. We're in Sydney and we're talking to her about her new book, The Chocolate Tin. But we're also going to ask her a few other questions as well. Okay, so I just want to ask you a few questions about the book. I mean, chocolate and romance, really. <laughs> you can't go wrong, can you? No, I mean, I just hit a gold with this one, didn't yeah. I? Um, yeah, the whole... I mean, I don't know why I took 31 books to decide to write a book about chocolate, because... I've got a clinical addiction to it anyway. I have um, noticed that on your Facebook yes, page. Yes, yeah. I'm really quite, I need it every day. Yeah. So um, now that I decided I'm going to write this book about chocolate, I didn't worry about story. A new story would find me. Yeah. I just had to put myself in the way of it to find me. And so, um, you know, on behalf of your readers, all the better reading readers, I dragged a very reluctant body for a gluttonous trip around Switzerland. I oh, did you? And ate my way around there. To no avail, I might add. Couldn't find the story. Moved to Brussels and had a fairly um, uh, feasting time there. And still no story. Bruges was next on the hit list. Yeah. Uh, Fabulous, but no story. Yeah. Lots of chocolate, 300 kilos heavier. I arrived into, you know, Paris thinking, well, I love what the French do with chocolate, so there's got to be a story here. No joy. No um, And I sort of stumbled into York, and there it was, my story. And that's unlikely, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I recognised all the chocolate bars of my childhood and um, the four famous families, round trees, Terry's, Fry's, Cadbury's, Bourneville, that's five actually. They were all there, all f Quakers, all from the north. Um, and I thought, oh gosh, it has to find me here. And it did. Came up and tapped me on the shoulder in the York Museum. And um, as soon as I saw the chocolate tin, as soon as I held the chocolate tin that was sent to the um, troops on the front line, I knew my story was locking in. And it's Roundtree who she who she works for, isn't it? Yes, so I, I love the round trees because of a particular character in the round tree family that I sort of um, use in the story very briefly. He just makes a small entrance and his name is Arnold Roundtree and he's called Chocolate Jumbo. And he's a really interesting man, but they're Quakers. All the um, chocolate families were Quakers and they had a fabulous outlook on life, which, I mean, I want to be a Quaker. The idea being make as much money as you can, in, you know, be rich, be super wealthy, but share it with the people who helped you to get there. So they've got this fabulous perspective. It's a story. Yeah, it's a yeah. very early socialist attitude towards their workers, and they really looked after them, and so Roundtree's just really lent itself to being part of this story. Well, Rennie says, can't wait to go and get it. Um, oh, yeah, Switzerland, the capital of chocolate, she says. Yeah. Hayley Maguire says, where is this live at? We're in Sydney, Hayley. We're at the Four Seasons, are we? Where are we? No, we're at the Park Royal Darling oh, Harbour. Oh, Park Royal Darling Harbour is exactly where we are in Sydney. Now, it does, the book itself delves into what I thought were some really big issues, big mm. issues about marriage. Um, it was set, what, in 1915, um, and there are some really confronting issues as well. But again, issues that are, you know, just as relevant now as they were back then, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I play with quite familiar themes, but this time this book took it into a whole new area. And you're right, because it struck me that it's actually very topical, some of those darker themes they that are. I was playing with. So. You know, as I said initially, I thought I was writing a story about a chocolate maker, but the story began to push and push and broaden, and it became um, a story that conflicted ambition um, with marriage and love versus duty, um, and also the secrets within a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, that every marriage has its secrets. If you don't know the other half very well, there is going to be baggage and you know if you if you don't explore it early yeah. well you might get a shock and without wanting to spoil yeah. the story um, Matthew in particular has one very big secret mm. and um, that's I thought you handled path. I thought it was handled beautifully though thank you thank you because I, he wasn't the villain was he no he's he's, he's absolutely yeah. delightful as a person yeah. and um, he's actually trying to protect everyone mm. um, by keeping this secret mm. and I didn't think that was the secret when I when I knew Matthew had one. I know I know we sound like we're talking circles. We're trying not to spoil it for you. Um, I thought he had another family. I began to think that's what this is, 
but then I began to realise what it was and it was when I went to um, the county um, lunatic asylum in York these are the kind of places I go to um, to find my story I realised what his secret was mm. and it was um, gosh it took mm. me into an arena I didn't know much about and when I started researching it it was huge now researching you touched on my next point I mean beautifully written really beautifully written Thank you. Uh, with you know it is romantic but it's serious and it's and it's at times very very challenging some of the issues and topics you you come across so it's it's not light in any in any way but it's it reads beautifully but what struck me what struck me with this book and what strikes me with your books is how well researched they are you know, that I'm reading fiction, but I'm reading fiction that's told in a truth. Um, and therefore, to me, I believe it. I'm in it. I go for the ride. Oh, that's fantastic. And that's, that's everything I'm trying to strive for, um, for the reader. And mm. I, I know it sounds like I'm onto a fabulous lark you know, travelling all over the world for the books, but unless I go to these places mm. and I do what I like to call due diligence and put my feet on the ground and experience as much of it as I can, um, then I can't evoke that era for the reader or the, the times. I have to get the sense of place absolutely spot on. You do. And once that's right, then I have to get the characters absolutely right and into their era. Um, it's one of the reasons why something like Downton Abbey works so brilliantly because they've paid so much attention to the um, detail and the surround and the, um, you know, getting the language right and the... And, yeah. um, and that's exactly what your books are. It's right. Every bit of it's right. Judy says, I want chocolate now. But she also says, fascinating that you talk about the secret as if you were discovering this story also. And that's true, isn't yeah. it? It's unravelling of the secret. Well, isn't it? it's also the, the way, um, Judy, that I write. Um, I don't plan my stories um, at all. I, I, as I said, I, I went overseas and I let the story find me. And it began with the, the chocolate tin. And from there on, the story had to tell itself to me. I don't plan it, so I sit down and write the story very quickly over about 12 weeks. But that's because I write organically, and whatever the characters are up to, that's where the story is going. And they is present that right? All, no yeah, planning. No plan. Nothing. Yeah, right. Nothing. Maurice here says she's just started the book. Enjoying it. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Are you enjoying it? I don't know if she's still with us, but I'm sure she is. So no planning at all? No, nothing more than um, a very rough arc that can go anywhere. Very uh, flexible and fluid for where it can go. And as I say, I didn't know what the secret was until um, it began to unfold for me. Also, right at the end, you know, you'd think I'd know my story by then, but right at the very end, um, a character walks in and it um, was such a shock for me. I thought, what are you doing here? And, and you're as surprised as the reader. I was. And, and uh, I don't want to spoil it, but that character nearly stole the book away because yeah. it was such a surprise. Um, people, The reader knows about this character and has an opinion on this character. And then when that person walks onto the pages, it changes your opinion completely. Certainly changed mine. So right. um, it was quite a shock was a big shock for my editor too so I think um, you know it's just my w weird wired way of writing um, that allows me so much scope and freedom. So Maurice has come back and she said I am enjoying it very much I just love the cover of the book as well oh, and Irene says great book have read and thoroughly enjoyed this book so she's oh, recommending well, thank it to you, the Irene. others thank what you. an amazing way to write uh, this would be so exciting and so interesting. I'm just going to show people the cover again because it really is quite beautiful. So if you don't have a copy, get yourself a copy because it is the cover is as luscious as the title and the story. It is, it's almost easy. You know, we really, really worked hard on yeah. this cover. We had so many incarnations. I think you've nailed it. Yeah, and we kept going back to the drawing board because none of us were satisfied until somebody very smart at Penguin said, you know, what about just a big red ribbon? And I said, that's it. They showed me a, a, a dummy of it and I said, that's it. And then we sort of went berserk and put loads of sort of red satin into the 
into the cover. Um, it's beautiful. It really is very I beautiful. I did have thoughts of putting smudges of chocolate all over it. <laughs> and then the production yes. person said enough. Yes, enough's <laughs> enough, Fiona. <laughs> enough's enough, Fiona. Yeah. We're chatting with the very adorable Fiona McIntosh. I mean, I've been a fan for a long time. You really are truly a very talented writer. Um, oh, Judy's off now to purchase the story, so she's oh, going. Um, I'm going to wind down now and say thank you so much for being with us. But just one more thing, I just want you to talk about, you run a writing course, don't you? I do. So for, all, for those of you uh, that want to be a fabulous writer like Fiona, she, she does run courses, so I think you can check it out at her website. Would that be yeah, right? Yeah, masterclasses, come and, come and talk to me. Um, there's one other thing I'd love to tell everybody yeah, about. And that absolutely, is go for it. That is this. Oh, chocolate. Now, we are very Can well aware. Can I do a close up? Yes, we're very well aware that this looks like a condom. It does look like a condom. It's not a condom. Right. It is a beautiful chocolate that looks like this. Ah. See, and it's made by. Stig Hang on, let me get a close up. Oh, gosh, it matches the book actually. Yeah, there it's you go. beautiful. It's beautiful. I'll tell you a little bit about this. Tell me about the chocolate. You remember with the perfumer secret, I yes. made a perfume um, yes. it for to go with the story, and yeah. women went wild around Australia for that perfume, and so I now have to manufacture that perfume, and we've sold about two hundred bottles. When it came around to writing the chocolate tin, I th Penguin said, "Yes, we know what you're going to say," and I said, "I, I really think we need a chocolate with this." So I got together with a artisan chocolatier called Stephen Tohorst in Adelaide, and. He said, give me some thoughts, and I said, okay, well, it's winter, you know, and um, the crocuses are just, just beginning to poke up, and her father goes to a gentleman's club, so it'll be tobacco and smoky cigars and pipes, and there's whiskey and, and brandy, and um, the, the poorer people have got cabbage on, on their stoves, and he said, can you just stop, because we are not going to flavour a chocolate with all of those flavours. So he said, pick pick one idea for me. And I was thinking that I'd love everyone to eat one of these chocolates when yeah. they with the opening chapter. And Alexandra, this girl on the cover, she loves to ride and she rides a horse called Blackberry. So I said, what about Blackberry? And so we freeze dried Blackberry to put on ah. the top of this 60% chocolate. Yeah. And I can assure you, this is absolutely stunning. Look, it looks still uh -huh. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that mm. is the very lovely, adorable, delightful Fiona McIntosh mm. eating chocolate that matches her new book, The Chocolate Tin. Um, thank you for joining us, Fiona. You're always so delightful. Always fun. Always thank you, fun. everyone. Um, and I know everyone's going to go, get, go out and get themselves a copy of the book. Thank you. Thank you.